Today at Manchester Theatres, we have a double whammy of fabulousness because we have not one but two of the stars of the, of the Sheila Delaney play, A Taste of Honey, which is coming to the Royal Exchange Theatre from the 15th of March. I am, of course, talking about Jill Halfpenny and Rowan Robinson. <laughs> yes, um, so we have actress and um, singer and radio presenter Jill who came to our screens, first of all, is a teenager in Biker Grove and went on to do amazing shows such as Coronation Street, Waterloo Road, EastEnders, and of course, the Strictly. The, the, the jive, you won Strictly, and people still talk about that jive even <laughs> today. On stage, Jill has appeared in shows such as Chicago, Calendar Girls, um, and given award-winning performances in Legally Blonde. Then we come to our fabulous, very own local actress, <laughs> Rowan Robinson, who is an actress, singer, musician, and a recent graduate from RADA, and already has secured fabulous roles um, with a new show that's coming out called Passenger, um, which is like a dark comedy. Mm -hmm. Then um, worked with Kenneth Branagh in A Haunting in Venice for Disney. She has performed for the National Theatre in 321 and even been directed by Sir Trevor Nunn in Shakespeare, A Man for All Time. So we are in amazing company today. So thank you both um, for joining us. Um, I'm really excited to chat about this show. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. So we've got Jill, you're playing Helen yeah. and then Rowan, you are playing Joe. So yeah. if you are able between you to just kind of recap the story for us, maybe through the eyes of your characters, mm -hmm. um, just so everyone can go, I remember now. <laughs> Oof. Um... <laughs> I mean, it's it's a it's a story about a relationship. It's a, it's a mother and daughter, and about the push and the pull and the conflict that they live through, and mm -hmm. the way that they live. They're outliers. They're a bit punk rock. They do what they want, and they um, certainly my character lives life for herself. And um, sometimes it's hard and dangerous, and other times it's boring, and she's waiting for something to happen. But I don't think it's necessarily what happens in the play so much that is is interesting it's it's the relationships in the play that are the thing that makes people go oh yeah i love yeah. this just watching watching people who are so familiar with each other just the way they talk and the way they shout and the way they dismiss each other mm -hmm. and then love each other mm -hmm. so yeah yeah, yeah it, it's fabulous isn't it and we we very often hear um all of the not negative as such, but oh, well, this character did that to that one, and this person did this, and oh, they're not very nice. But there's so much more than that as well. So, what do you both like about your characters as well? I love about Jo that she is very unapologetically herself. She will just tell you if she doesn't like you. Um, she's very blunt and sarcastic, um, and she's really funny. And I love. I just love like playing her and getting to live in that world. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I think um, Helen is funny. I think together, yeah. they're very, they mm. make each other laugh. Mm -hmm. They might not show each other that they're laughing, but they definitely <laughs> think that was a good one. Yeah. That was a good one. She yeah. Said. Um, yeah, it's the same, unapologetic. Um, maybe I think the thing that I love most about Helen is that she, um, she lives her life in the way that she wants to live it even though she knows there is a lot of judgment yeah. um, from other people and yet she will continue to do what she wants because even though I don't think she necessarily likes the judgment, mm -hmm. she's prepared to rise above it for the sake of living her life in her way. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's like, it's interesting, isn't it, when you hear, um, like, regrets of the dying, the top regret yes. is always, I didn't live my life for me. Mm. Now, I'm sure these characters <laughs> would have some regrets, yeah. but they're certainly living the li them lives yeah. for themselves. Mm. Um, so that's, that's always really interesting yeah. when somebody is really, you think, have they been here before? Because they are racing through life in a way yeah. that seems so courageous. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and one of, I mean, there's so many brilliant things about this, but one of the just subtly clever and brilliant genius things is the age that um, Sheila Delaney wrote Joe at. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you've got a mother-daughter relationship and all of those things that you've talked about, but 
had she have made a younger or even in her 20s or something mm. like that, the dynamic would have been so different. You've got someone who's not quite a child, but not quite an adult, and we've all been there, mm. haven't we? So it's, what, do you think that makes a huge difference to... Definitely, mm. yeah. I mean, I think Sheila Delaney uh, wrote a lot of herself into mm. the characters, and, like, we watched, like, a few documentaries and stuff, and we were talking about how Sheila's, like, brother and her dad were both called Joe, and, like, she used to work at a photography place and retouch photos, so she's put, like, little bits of her life in it, and I think that's really important to, to have a, a girl write about mm. a girl and a woman's experience. Yeah, and, and like you said, the, the, the ages, she's just coming into womanhood mm. and effectively, it's not that I'm leaving womanhood, but what I'm effectively walking towards is, is menopause. Mm. So she's coming in and I'm about to sort of go out in that kind of like traditional sense of the way you would mm. see um, sort of femininity or a woman. And that's what Sheila plays with a lot, you know, like our bodies mm. and what they're meant for and what they're worth and how people judge them at what age and it's uh, you know there's so much language around our bodies yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah and she, i mean everything she did that i mean she was what 18 when she wrote this play she's 19 yeah. Yeah. Still still 19, like, yeah. Mm -hmm. and i mean it was i mean it's still groundbreaking even now but you know plays weren't written by working class women and mm. about women mm. um with women at the center of it and and yes there's men in the play but they're not the focus they're kind of the, the tools that are played with to tell your story mm. um and even today weirdly that still feels important doesn't mm. it that you know that these working class normal voices are getting told it was so groundbreaking but even today um, pushing it forward so it, it is a brilliant brilliant thing isn't it With mm. yeah and I think just like uh, you know like like Rowan has said like the way that she portrays women who are not traditionally living their life in the way that one might expect them to be living in that era especially but even now even now if two women lived like Helen and Joe there would be comments there would be judgment it's happening of course but people would still say oh no that's not quite right mm. so the fact that this is in the 50s and they're doing it yeah it's like wow yeah that's really really quite like anarchic yeah it, it it's incredible and um we do have as we've said men in the play peter <laughs> <laughs> just that one word um, so he, he, i mean it's interesting because Joe obviously has her opinions of Peter, um, and then Helen has hers, but still, even though he tells her, you know, the streets are littered with, with women that I've kind of discarded, she's still prepared to, to go into that. And is, is that a kind of better the devil you know? Is it a feeling of her own self-worth that, well, that's all I deserve, or...? Yeah, I think there's a line where she says, I certainly supervise my own downfall. Mm. And, you know, she's 40. And 40 doesn't seem old anymore, but 40 when you were in the 50s felt like, again, like going into that sort of next phase of your life. And I think you're right. I think there's a lot of things going on. I think it's better the devil you know. I think it's, we talk a lot in the rehearsal room about these characters. They, um, they don't necessarily, well, Helen doesn't plan. She doesn't think, where would I like to be in five years time? <laughs> yeah. She thinks, where do I want to be tomorrow? Yeah. Mm. So she grabs at things. She wants that sort of immediate relief and release. Mm -hmm. You know, she's an addict and she wants to feel good. So she doesn't really think through, or, or maybe she doesn't need to think through. She knows it'll end in disaster. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the point. No. The point is how much goodness can I get out of it? Yeah. How much mm -hmm. excitement, how much booze, how much sex can I get for yeah. the next however many months? So I think that's what she does. She just grabs it, what is in front of her, because maybe she feels like it's too late to start again for her. Mm. So she's like, you know what? This is her last yeah. hurrah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's so brilliantly, there's so much detail. Um, and then, of course, we have Jeff. Oh, yeah. We've got <laughs> Jeff, who is completely the opposite to that. And he yeah. loves Joe, um, not romantically, but unconditionally. And that sense of unconditional love does seem to be like a, an alien concept yeah. to, to both of them. And Helen, as we know, pushes him away, kind of like gets rid of him. Um, so I'm curious to, to 
sort of go through that and wonder, is it because maybe she sees him as a threat or is it, does Jo let that happen? Because again, she thinks, well, I'm, if, if, you know that thing of like, well, God, if he loves me, there's got to be something wrong with him kind mm-hmm. of situation mm-hmm. that she doesn't have that self-belief or? I think it's a bit of both of mm-hmm. them things. I think um, for Jo, it's, she says, oh, I wish, I wish she was here all the time you know, when she's not seen her for months or whatever. And I think that that is really important for Jo throughout the play is she is, she says all these like things that berating a mum and calling a mum this and that, but really she's saying, oh, I just want you to like love me and I just want you to be here with me and to look after me and to care for me. And so I think when it gets to that end bit with Jeff, it's like, <sighs> she, I don't think she quite lets it happen, but she knows that. Mm her mum's back and okay maybe this will be the chance that maybe this will be the time that my mum finally looks after me and takes mm-hmm. care of me and becomes the mum that I've wanted her to be yeah 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 and I, exactly and I think Helen I mean on a very practical level that flat can't accommodate three people <laughs> mm-hmm. but on a much more emotional level you know Helen does have a very practical side to her and what she sees is her daughter who has done all the things that she's asked her not to do. She's got herself pregnant and now she's living with a man who clearly doesn't love her because that's not what his interests are. And what Helen sees is even though she's a quite modern woman, I don't think she sees how that could work. Mm. So although she's really quite abusive towards Jeff, I think what she's saying is this man is not going to look after you. This man is not going to be able to pay the rent. This man mm. is not going to be able to go out and work for you. He's got, he's got his own life to live. Mm. So I think, even though it seems quite cruel what she's doing, I think what she's saying is you, you need to be, like, life is hard. Mm. You're a really young girl and now you've got a baby. I did exactly the same and it was rough. Yeah. So yeah. I need things to be in place for you. And I think that's one of the reasons why she stays away for so long. I think she's like, Mm-hmm. putting money away as well mm-hmm. to make sure that she's got something to bring back to her. So how do you think, because as you said, she comes back at the end um, and hopefully the idea is that it is genuine. Mm-hmm. If it's because Peter's kicked her out or not, we don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, if you could kind of look into the future of your characters, where <laughs> would you like to see them and um, what do you think might have happened, like maybe a year or two down the line from the end of the play? Do you mean um, in an entertaining way, or do you mean? <laughs> <in> <laughs> a, you choose to answer. I mean, I think Helen would have to not. H- Helen would have to get rid of her addiction yeah. to be able to be what Joe needs her to be, and I can't see that happening. Mm. That's probably yeah. the best way for me to say that. That's mm. so. I see this this constant like push and pull yeah. i just see that continuing until helen becomes worse and worse and then poor joe probably has to really look after her at one point that's what i would imagine that is not a rosy view <laughs> and i know that will upset some people but that's kind of how i yeah. see it at the moment i think in our version of the play because obviously like when it was originally written it had a different ending and they did mm-hmm. all sorts mm-hmm. of workshops you know back in the day and so I think it has changed a lot where I see it and because of Helen's last line for me that's Joe's moment of going okay you've insulted me so much but now you're coming for my kid now you're coming for my child, mm. that's, no, I'm not going to turn into you. So where I see Jo going in a year's time is she doesn't have that relationship with her mum and she's with her baby and she's doing well and she's doing her art. And um, yeah, and that's what I see as Jo's taste of honey. That's, that's the end. Really, yeah. yeah. I, think, well, I think you're right. I think that's really like... I want that for Joe. Mm. Yeah. Well, mm. I was going to actually ask that, so you've kind of just answered. So, <laughs> what do you see as your character's taste of honey? Um, you've, you've sort of already yeah. <laughs> answered for us there, Rowan. So, yeah, I Helen? think unfortunately, for Helen's taste of honey is um, is is usually quick fixes. Mm. It's it's kind of um, 
a bit of indulgence. It's, it's a bit hedonistic. Um, but, you know, ultimately, Helen wants the same as what Joe wants. She wants to be loved, yeah. really. I mean, that's the simple as it is. Mm -hmm. But Helen's never going to get to that unless she can put something down and see past it. So, as the, so if the drink is always in front of her, that's always going to be the block to what she gets. So at the minute, her <laughs> taste of honey is um, what she can get. Yeah. <laughs> She very what much you can lives grab at. Moment, she, she very much yeah. lives in the moment. <laughs> and I kind of love that about her as well yeah. because we plan, we think, and we have all these pl uh, 10 year plan, 15 year. I mean, it's like I quite like the, this, the, the, the presentness of her sometimes, but mm. yeah. you know, I also wouldn't want to be her. No. <laughs> I honestly could sit and chat about this play all day <laughs> with you both, but I do know that you are in the middle of rehearsals. Mm. So um, I will say thank you both so, so much. And um, I cannot wait to come along and see you both <laughs> as Helen and Joe in A Taste of Honey. Uh -huh. um, as a reminder, it's going to be at the Royal Exchange from the 15th of March, and we will see everybody there. Thank you so, so much and all <laughs> the best. Thank you. That was lovely. So thank you very much. <laughs> thank you.